Hi, everyone, and welcome to our monthly research brief. I'm Vanessa Weisberg from the Celiac Disease Program at Boston Children's Hospital, and this month we're talking about the new guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology on the diagnosis and management of celiac disease. As usual, well, we have our Director of Research, Dr. Jocelyn Sylvester, here to answer questions about the new guidelines. So, Dr. Sylvester, let's start by discussing why there needed to be new guidelines. What has changed? That's a great question, and I think one of the things that's changed is that societies are really trying to think about their guidelines and updating them. And so the last guideline was back in 2013. So it's been 10 years. So I think that was the impetus to change the guideline. Who was involved in creating the new guidelines? So it was a committee of gastroenterologists uh, who are specialists in celiac disease. And this is sort of the standard process for making practice guidelines. So usually they're made by experts. And then what's important is that some of the people who participated in this process were um, methodology experts, because one of the things that's important about guidelines is that they be evidence-based. And so they actually had a team who reviewed the publications since the last guideline and provided summaries to help guide the people who were making the guidelines, whether or not the methodology of the studies was statistically sound um, and whether or not the quality of the evidence was high, low, or in the middle. Can you tell us what were the new big developments in the new guidelines? So I think the thing that surprised us, particularly as pediatric gastroenterologists, was that there was comment about making a non-biopsy diagnosis of children. And this was presented that there's not enough data in adults, and it's not clear that it's specific enough in adults but it's okay for children, um, even though there's actually not a lot of data for children in North America as well. And so they gave a recommendation that the diagnosis should be by biopsy, but they also recommended that in children it's acceptable to use a quote non-biopsy diagnosis, which by this we're referring to European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition Criteria, which would be having two different blood draws with two different positive serology tests. So typically the first one is a tissue transcontaminase IgGA, a TTG IgA, because that's the first line screening test. And if that one is more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, then the EMA IgA or the endomesial antibody is another way of looking at the same thing. And so they recommend doing that on a second sample because you can always have lab error. And the Europeans recommend this only for symptomatic patients. And that if the patients are asymptomatic, then there's really not the data to support. So one of the recommendations that's been talked about online says that the endpoint of the gluten-free diet therapy is intestinal healing and that clinicians should create individualized goals for each of your patients. Can you talk more about this? what this means? Is the gluten-free diet not the same for everyone? So I think it's a great question. And I think one of the problems is we don't really know what intestinal healing is. And so um, when we look at people who've had follow-up biopsies, we see that it seems like age can be a fairly strong predictor of whether or not people have healed. Um, and we also don't routinely check to see if people have healed, in part because, as you mentioned, the only really treatment we have is to adjust the gluten-free diet. And there's certainly varying degrees of strictness for the gluten-free diet. And it's not clear that everybody needs a so-called ultra strict gluten-free diet, which would involve not eating any processed foods and not eating whole categories of foods, even if they're in their whole form that could potentially have been contaminated. So um, it's not really clear exactly what that means or exactly how we're supposed to implement it. I wonder if part of the reason that it's in there is more thinking forward to the potential of having medications and what that would mean and what potential outcomes for clinical trials should be. As I think we've discussed before, there's some controversy about whether symptoms or histology are a better outcome. Absolutely. So the guidelines mention staying away from gluten detection devices. Can you talk more to our listeners about what this means and how it applies to your patients in clinic? I think gluten detection, detection devices are something that we're We've, we've been excited about, but now that we've had them around for a while, we've realized that we don't really know how to use them. And one of the problems is that gluten is a little bit complicated 
not just in terms of understanding food labels, but also biochemically, which means it's also complicated in terms of trying to find it in food or stool or urine for that matter. And so I think the position of the panel was that we really don't have an, enough evidence to know how to use these. And so if we don't know what we're doing, then perhaps we shouldn't do it. Now, arguably, we also don't have enough evidence to know whether or not people have mucosal healing. And if we don't know what we're doing, we shouldn't do that either. So I think like many things, although we strive to be evidence-based, these become a judgment call. Absolutely. So the guidelines addressed oats, which we know are very complicated in the celiac disease community. And they said that including gluten-free oats as part of one's diet for those with CD is recommended. Can you talk more about what we do at Boston Children's with incorporating oats into the diet? Yes. And I think this is probably one of the areas where it's helpful to have a guideline because there is a lot of practice variability. And I think the pendulum has certainly swung here at Children's. And now for the most part, we're starting on a oats containing gluten-free diet, but if patients are having any problem at all, one of my first things to do is take the oats and yes, that means the Oreo cookies away. And so um, part of the reason for this is that there has been some data suggesting that although people may have symptoms to oats, it doesn't necessarily look like they're having mucosal damage uh, using the measures that were used in those studies. So, and most of our patients now that there's more rigor in how gluten-free oats are gluten-free have seemed to be tolerating them. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sylvester, for taking the time to talk about these new guidelines for our patient families. We hope everyone enjoyed this research brief and we'll be back with another one soon.